Hello and welcome to the second episode of this video series. So yes, this is the second episode. So if you haven't yet watched the first one, please go back and find that one because we're doing the parasites in the order of appearance here. So first parasite that came first was Strongyloides westri. And then today's parasite is the next one that the foe encounters. Once again, my name is Martin Nielsen. I'm a horse parasitologist here at the University of Kentucky and welcome to my lab. Today's topic is the parasite that we call Parascaris. In daily terms, uh, it's most often referred to as Ascarid uh, parasites. A lot of common names are involving the term roundworm, which is true, they are round, they do belong to the family, the order of nematodes. So nematode in Latin actually means round worm, but that actually covers all of the parasites that the horses get. All of the all of the worms that look like a worm, they're round worms. So some say large round worm. And so often that's, when people say that, they do mean the ascarate parasite, but the more correct term would be an ascarate. Um, for those of you who are veterinarians or perhaps veterinary students or biologists, um, a little bit of extra information here. There's actually two different species infecting the horse. So we have Parascaris equorum. That is the one that you would normally find if you look up a textbook. Uh, but there's also another species, Parascaris univalens. Both of those were actually described all the way back in the 1870s. But for some reason, this univalens one sort of disappeared out of the attention, at least out of the attention of us veterinarians. Uh, it was still being used for research in on other topics. The only way to tell these two parasites apart is to look at their chromosomes and count how many they have. Univalence has, guess, one pair of chromosomes, whereas Equorum has two. In our work, we've shown that uh, it's actually univalence that's the common one. And and equorum is hard to find these days. So we don't think it really matters. It's just a matter of what name we assign to the parasite. But fundamentally, there are two species with Parascaris univalens being the common one. So as you know, I'm a parasitologist and I cannot give a presentation on anything related to my work without looking at a parasite life cycle. Uh, so let's pull that up here for this parasite. So. Here we have the typical so-called fecal oral route. So the foals are ingesting something, could be grass, uh, that is contaminated with the eggs that are uh, having the infective stage of the parasite inside of them. And then they get infected that way. That is the only route of infection. And horse, foals are actually being infected from the environment. There's a lot of discussion as to whether it comes from the mares, but the mares don't have this parasite. This is a foal parasite. So they infect uh, the foals by just basically eating the eggs when they're at the infective stage. And then what makes this parasite really fascinating is what it does once it's inside the animal because it takes this lengthy migration through the body. You kind of wonder why that's even necessary. Uh, so they leave the intestinal tract, they get into the bloodstream, make it to the lungs, and then migrate through to the airway and the air and the trachea and then they sort of make it back up to the to the pharynx to the mouth and then um, the horses the foals would cough and swallow and then for the second time they make it down to the intestinal tract and finally reach the small intestine which is where they basically hang out for the rest of their lives so why is that even necessary well that's a philosophical question um, why do they have to do all the migration? But it seems that whenever a parasite does that, it's because it needs to grow and it needs a lot of nutrient. And there's a lot of nutrient if you just munch through the tissues. Uh, and that's what they do. Um, so that's the life cycle. There's also a lot of discussion about those eggs. Um, we can pull up a picture of one here. They have this very thick, that brown shell that you see here in the picture. And that does make these eggs very resilient in the environment. They tolerate um, a lot of different adverse weather reactions, temperature, um, desiccation, et cetera, and certainly frost. And there's been a lot of claims out there that these eggs can remain alive and infective in the environment for up to 20 years. Don't believe that. 
Uh, there's really no evidence behind that. Uh, maybe somebody once did that in a study in a lab and just sort of extrapolated and said, well, if it's like this in my lab, it's probably like that everywhere in the world. What we have uh, evidence for here is that these eggs actually tolerate cold weather very well. So they, they do survive from one year to the next year over one winter. So the, the foals from this year will leave some parasite eggs behind and then those eggs will be out there waiting for the next year's crop of foals that will then pick them up. And we also have some evidence suggesting that those eggs can also survive in some proportion into the second year. But once you get beyond that, there's not gonna be much left. And they really don't tolerate warm weather very well, if at all. Um, so warm weather, by that I mean temperatures uh, above 40 degrees Celsius or approximately 100 and something Fahrenheit. Forgive me, I'm European, so I'm not really good with that um, temperature scale, but something around there. They don't tolerate that very well for more than just a few days. So that's about the life cycle. Um, when do we actually see this parasite uh, and how common is it? So I've already said this is a foal parasite and it's one of those where we basically just have to consider that any foal in the world, regardless of where in the world, regardless of what environment it's born into, is going to be exposed to this parasite. Um, there are differences in terms of how common it is and how big of infection they get, but do consider this a parasite that's just normal for any foal. So let's lo look at a graph from this uh, research herd that we have here. If you watched the first video, you've already heard about it, the historic parasitology herd that hasn't been dewormed since 1979. What does it look like if you look at egg output in foals across age? So here's a graph. It's a nice kind of bell-shaped curve. It starts at about two and a half to three months of age is where the foals start to have these eggs in their fecal sample. And then it continues to about 16, 20, maybe 22 weeks of age. So that's about six months. So between three months and six months, that's where it all comes down. That's where it all happens. And you'll notice there's a peak there right in the middle, four to five months of age. That's where the egg counts are the highest. I and mean, we've actually also shown using ultrasound that it's also where the worm counts are the highest. So that's right where everything peaks. What do we often do at approximately five months of age? Yeah, we wean our foals, at least a lot of us do. So you know, keep this in mind that you might wanna take care of the ascarid parasite burdens uh, before you go into that weaning procedure that is a stressful time for those foals. So this, is pa this pattern is actually very normal. We see it across the world, not just in our research herd here. This is something we have documented in various different countries. You may also notice if you follow that graph right out beyond the 24 weeks of age, some of the eggs are coming back at low counts at a little bit later age. We call that the second wave of infection. The horses don't have nearly as many worms. They're at yearling age now. Uh, their, their egg counts aren't as high, but they sometimes come back in a few short yearlings for a short period of time. So yet again, there's reason to get those egg counts done so we can make sure what parasites our young horses are having. So that's certainly uh, something that I think applies across the board. So is it every single foal that becomes egg count positive? No, it actually is not. And, and that's interesting as well. So depending on farm, depending on management, depending on a lot of factors that we haven't really identified yet, the prevalence uh, in foals could be anywhere from 50% to 80% of the foals that are actually shedding the ascarid eggs at any given point in time. Now, they have all been exposed, but some, for some reason, are just more resilient to the parasite than others. So they don't get very many worms or they may not get any at all. But as a rule of thumb, they all are exposed to this parasite. So that was about the occurrence. What about disease? Well, this parasite is the most important parasite in our foals. This is the one that can cause disease. And this is why we need to consider it in our parasite control programs. This does not mean that it causes disease every single time it infects a foal. I mean, remember, if I said 80% of the foals are infected, it's not 80% of the foals that are showing any symptoms of disease. 
but it can't happen, right? It's biology. It's not in the interest of the parasite, but sometimes it can cause this, this uh, you know, unwanted effect on, their, on its host. So what are the symptoms? Well, one is that the parasite competes with its host for nutrients. So if you have a lot of worms like this, is, is from one animal here, um, you have probably also noticed the uh, jar that's sitting here right behind me. That's more than a thousand worms from one foal. If you have that many worms, then they are munching away and they're eating the food, the nutrients that the horse was supposed to get, and or at least a big proportion of it. So competing with its host for nutrient, yeah, uh, that can lead to stunted growth, rough uh, hair coat, pup belly appearance, um, not necessarily diarrhea, but sometimes also diarrhea. So yeah, um, the most significant condition that this parasite can cause is again, when we have a large number of worms, remember these live in the small intestine. The small intestine, you know, it's long, very long, but it has a very narrow space. So you can imagine what can happen. They can clog the whole system up and an impaction, a clog in the small intestine is a very serious condition. It's very different than your large intestinal impaction that many of you horse owners have probably experienced. You know, the type of colic where you have to walk your horse until it poops? That one? Yeah. That's not like this in foals. It's very painful. They need to be hospitalized. And when it happens, a lot of them also need surgery to basically relieve this, this clog. And foals really struggle recovering from that. So talking about the competition for nutrients, I, I, I have a nice little display here. Um, these are all intestinal stages in these three jars. Um, so basically they all live in the small intestine. They have about this size when they uh, first make it to the small intestine, so little itty bitty larvae. And then over the cause, course of say eight weeks, eight to 10 weeks or so, they grow and they munch away and they grow and they get bigger and bigger uh, and then, um, you know, increase in size. So, so there's, a, there's an, you know, you can clearly understand why they, they do need all that nutrient because that's a significant amount of growth in a very short amount of time. So, um, so disease can be, um, certainly can happen, and uh, some of you may have experienced this. Just still remember, if all of the foals are exposed to this parasite, it's very, very few foals that actually get the disease. But nonetheless, we do want to consider deworming our foals and doing it appropriately at the right time with the right dewormer. So what is the right dewormer? We have to be aware that there's a lot of drug resistant resistance reported in this parasite. The two most widely used types of dewormer, the ones that are containing ivermectin and moxidectin in large part of the world do not work anymore. And this is across the world, different continents, wherever somebody decides to do a study looking at does this thing work or not, they invariably find that ivermectin products do not work. Moxidectin is really not labeled for the younger foals. It can be used in the older foals, and it's the same mode of action as ivermectin. So if ivermectin doesn't work, moxidectin is not going to work either. So that's important to know. So do not use ivermectin unless you've shown that for some reason it still miraculously works on your farm, and then I just wouldn't recommend it. We have two other classes of dewormer. We have the benzimidazoles and we have the pyrantil products. Now, uh, if you compare those two, there's been a few reports, not like widespread, but a few cases of reduced efficacy of some of these drugs as well against this parasite. But it doesn't hasn't really come to the to the point where we can say that there's widespread resistance. But there's certainly reason to also check whether your treatment actually worked. And we if we compare the two. The benzaminosols that includes fenbendazole, oxybendazole, etc., they have a different mode of action that's slower. It kills the worms little by little over the course of a few days as opposed to paralyzing them all at once. So that's preferred because if you have this many, you know, we get them coming out little by little rather than all at once, and that risk of that clog is substantially less. So 
that's it for this parasite, Parascaris species, the ascarid, the large round worm, whatever you want to call it. What do we want to leave with uh, today is that this is the parasite that looks like pasta, but really isn't. And it's the one parasite where size actually matters. So thank you for your attention. Stay tuned for the next video right here on this side. Thank you so much.